What's going on, everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys know it is. This is Kevin from the Core Progression Podcast, brought to you by my song of the day, Rock 2000. Wishing you a happy Tuesday here. And I've got another great interview as well, because, you know, that is what I do. But before I go into that, let me go through my shameless plugs. So, of course, if I had any advertisement, which I don't right now, because... Well, I'm not going to lie. It's like anytime I try and get advertising, it's the, the brands that want to work with me. They really are very stringent with what they want me to do. And it's just, it just doesn't work out with what I'm trying to do here or how I want to fit it in. Not going to do it. So just going to plug our stuff. So please follow my song of the day, Rock Styles Day, on places like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you get the 30-second song of the day feature where you can get the, you know, fall in love with bands you used to love, fall in love with bands you don't know yet, listen to some songs, and just kind of get, you know, your rock and metal knowledge to grow, basically. That's the best way to put it. We also ask you a bunch of different questions. They're connected through many different ways. Um, ask you like a bunch of questions like, okay, this is what was your favorite uh, band? What's this band? Okay, what's your album from this band? We put two bands together. Tell us who you like out of these two and why. What's your favorite song from this band? Um, what are you guys listening to? That kind of stuff. We do also put out anytime we like put out a new podcast, video on YouTube, whatever it might be. We put all that all out there. And then also on Instagram, we have our IGTV series every single Tuesday night. It's behind the scenes like what we're doing here. And then every Wednesday night, we do a live stream at 9 p.m. Central Time. It's an hour you come talk to us, you know, chit chat, have a good time with us. Also, please subscribe to this YouTube channel that we're on. Or if you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, My Sunday Rock 2008 YouTube channel. We do a lot of videos that are released every single Wednesday night, such as album reviews, top 10 lists, answering questions. Um, one of my favorites is the Kevin Figures Out series where I try and figure out of a band if I really don't like them or not, especially if I don't know them that much. Those are always fun. And then the Core Progression podcast, which I'm starting to call, you know, we're unearthing the underground because a lot of bands that aren't all that well known that are emerging in the scene and you need to know about them. So that's what we're going to be interviewing here on the Core Progression podcast. You can watch those interviews with those bands here on the YouTube channel or you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. <clears throat> But now, here we're going to get into this one. So I had an email from someone out in Italy that said, hey, check out this band and please promote them for us. So I listened to them. They're punk rockers out of Seattle, Washington. And I was like, interesting. So I messaged the person that sent me the email back. I'm like, how can I get in contact with this band? There's specific content to get into. I heard nothing back from them. So I just went straight to the source. I just went right to them on Instagram. I'm like, hey, uh, so we talked a little bit and now we have a podcast with them. So please welcome from Seattle, Washington, the guys from the band Head Honcho. This is a fun one, guys. Trust me on this one. So get ready. Are you ready? Have a listen and let's go. Yeah. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners of the Core Progression Podcast, I had some random email come into my email inbox to check out this band and to see if I could, you know, promote anything about them. I listened to their music and I reached out to the person sent me the email saying, yeah, I'd like, can I get in contact with them somehow? Never really got heard back from them after about a couple of days, so I decided to go straight to the source and, well... That worked out because here they are. So coming out of Seattle, watching these punk rockers, I listened to their newest album, Appetite for Distraction, which looking at the album cover, it is rather hilarious that they kind of parodied the Appetite for Destruction Guns N' Roses cover. Absolutely loved it. So please welcome the guys from Head Honcho. Guys, welcome to the Core Progression Podcast. Hey, thank you, brother. Thanks a lot. All right, before we get really into the like depth of everything, can I just... Um, get an introduction from you guys so that everyone listening knows who you are, what you do in the band. And if you have anything weird else to say about it, cause I always like to see if there's anything else you guys want to say about it. I've had people give me like their Tinder bios for some reason. That was always hilarious. So, uh, well, I'm PJ Gemini Taurus cusp. Uh, I, uh, am the singer in uh head honcho and yep. That's what I do. <laughs> My name's Nanda. I play guitar, uh, backup vocals, and yeah, that's uh, that, that's that's my role in the band. That and uh, being the butt of the rolling jokes of the ever changing name. <laughs> yes. So, so what do you mean by the butt of the jokes of the ever changing name? We went on tour in uh, 2018 in in Europe and uh, with a band called The Effect Heuristic, who are an amazing band. People should check out during the technical skate punk. And uh, 
I had been buddies with a couple of guys in the band before, but some of the other guys I didn't really know very well. And uh, they had decided uh, immediately on meeting me that every time somebody addressed me, they had to make up a new name for me. So I basically was answering to anything. I mean, at first it were things that rhymed, but eventually it would just become whatever was hilarious for the day. <laughs> it, yeah, it was... It, it, was, it was funny for the first couple days. <laughs> Say, was it just like everyone was just like, hey, you with a face. And then you just responded, what, what, what was that? You talking to me? It, it usually would have, you know, maybe some similar significance or some similar sounds in it. Bandana, anaconda. You know, but 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 it got it got more ridiculous as time went on. And still to this date, when I get messages from those guys, they're always prefixed with a name I haven't heard before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. So. It was is that how you got connected with the label that you're with right now? Because that's why I got the email from over in Europe. I just thought, how does a band from Seattle get associated with a label over in Europe? Like, and I, I had I I really want to ask that question because I just want to know this story. So, well, so Gaster Records uh, in Italy is uh, one of the guys that's that's in the labels. A guy named uh, Pier Paolo Lessi. He's the singer guitar player for Disordine, and uh, they're like a his voice is amazing. They're kind of a bad religion esque kind of that style of punk. And uh, I actually met him at Punk Rock Holiday in uh, Poland, Slovenia, in the summer of uh, 2015. It was late at night, and uh, I was at the bar. And the way they do it there is you have to during the day you pay cash and you put it on a card, and then you you know you debit your card throughout the day. And he didn't have enough money for a beer, so I I bought him a beer, and uh, that just kicked off a you know multi hour conversation and. And uh, we've been friends for years since. And, uh, you know, this, this is the first summer I will have not seen him in five or five years, I think, because, you know, due to the pandemic. So that that's how we got to know him. And then uh, I didn't actually know that he was – Gaster Records happened later after I had met him. I didn't know that he was doing that when he – I sent him a link to our album, you know, one of the early mixes, and that's when he started talking to us about uh, working together for some uh, distribution and promotion in Europe. And it all started out because you bought this guy a beer. Yeah, and it's 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 pretty awesome. We've been we become really good friends. You know, my family, my wife and kids and I um, spent some time actually with uh, him in his his hometown, and he took us all around and showed us all these really cool places. Um, he lives in the Lakes region, which is kind of north of Verona. Um, it's it's just really interesting. It's a it's a kind of a small town, but it's. Uh, I don't know. It, it's pretty amazing. Like it, it, best best beer I ever bought. That's for sure. You know, so easily. I've been trying. To, I was get over to Europe last year. And I want to get back over there at some point this year. But um, yeah, of course, because the coronavirus that you know went awry. So not too happy about that. So I kind of I, I don't necessarily feel as much as you do on that, just because you it's first time not seen him in like what did you say five years? Yeah, it's it, it'll be the first time we haven't been able to hang out in the summer in five five years. I think. Well, then that means next time you get to go over there, you're just going to have to, you know, make it twice as long or three times as long, however long it takes. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's the plan. That's the, it'll definitely be making up for lost time. But it is, it is cool how this this kind of punk rock community works. I mean, it's, it's little meetings like this that kind of make everything happen. Oh, I totally agree. There's one band that I interviewed. This was back in March, and it was just because my buddy sent me their their album. He's like, "Hey, check it out." So I did. I asked if I could interview them. End up talking with the the uh their the band manager who manages a bunch of different bands over in Italy as well. It's like, all right, now we can interview this one and this one and this one if you want to, because they had fun. I'm like, oh well, that that works, I guess. So it's just all those weird connections just really work out well in the end. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 pretty awesome, and it uh, was a big part of you know people that I'd met along the way were a big part of that that tour uh, tour happened for us. But the, the uh, European scene does a really good job of kind of welcoming people in and making it pretty clearly about cooperation and not competition. And yeah, yeah, it yeah. is a being somebody who's toured quite a bit of the United States and then getting to go over to Europe. It is a night and day difference as far as uh you know just support overall uh you know with with everything you know people even if they're not into you they're still there to enjoy music and give everything a chance and it's a lot of uh community is a big is a 
the word that I would use to describe, like just the general European Union's punk rock scene. I would have to too, because I mean, I only was over there once, but just kind of just getting to know as many people as possible was incredibly easy. It was it, it was awesome. And that's why like, I would plan on going over there this year because it was I was going to spend like two, two and a half weeks over there and just bouncing around to so many different places and seeing as many different shows as possible from bands. If it was like, you know, all of a sudden if I found out as LA Dying was going to be playing somewhere in, like in Vienna, I would go to that show and be huge. But if it was going to be like a smaller band in a smaller venue, I was still going to go anyway because I just like, you know what? I want to see what the local scene is like, see how that's all going to play out and just see what happens. You never know. Yeah. So let's go back. Let's actually jump in ahead, Honcho, because I think that's the, you know, the, the real reason why we're here is because of you guys and your music. So how did Head Honcho start? How did you guys come together to form this band? So uh, PJ was kind of the, the, last, the last piece to the puzzle. Um, prior to that, uh, so the original, original lineup, um, we, since, since we started, uh, we've had a drummer change and a bass player change was relatively recent. Um, and we'll, you know, get into that. But like, since we started the originally the drummer, bass player, the other guitar player, myself had all played together in a, not just before this band, we weren't all playing together, but we had played together previously and in other car- incarnations of, uh, some of us in a band called gut bomb. And then, uh, for a real short time in a band called Wadsworth. And, um, so we had slowly kind of gotten back together after doing other things for a while, having a few year hiatus. And, uh, we just kind of lucked out that our drummer at the time, uh, Clint had, had met uh, a guy named Noah who knew PJ who was, uh, looking for a band to sing in. And, um, that introduction was, was kind of it, you know, as soon as we, had a chance to have him come in. We were, we were super excited about what that was going to mean for us. And, uh, that was like late 2012, I think. And that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much been it since, since there, like I mentioned, there were a couple of lineup changes. Our, uh, drummer had, had a surgery related issue at sort of an inflection point for us and decided to, to step down. And that was, I think that was about, three years ago i think two and a half years yep. ago and um our, our bass player just had a another child recently and just the that that with a lot of any you know he's self-employed and all those responsibilities got to a point where he had to had to step down and so our buddy uh, justin who's a singer for a really good technical band with a lot of metal influence called antler bag he's a singer bass player there um he agreed to, to join us on bass and We've only had one show with him so far, but we've had a uh, you know months to months to practice with him, and by the time we play another show, it'd be many many more months of practicing with him. So, yeah, but then when he comes into the band too, and all of a sudden like you've only played one show with them, but now that you know everyone's kind of shut down and everything, you know, you got time to just practice with each other and get to know how everybody plays together, so that by the time you go up on stage, that chemistry is going to be there. Well, that's, that's the hope. And we haven't really been practicing together collectively, but we've been doing a lot of like, um, two person activities, you know, like I've been doing a couple of different things with the drummer that are not band related, but the music related just to keep us kind of focused on what we're doing. And, um, got some plans. The other guitar player and I have some plans to start uh, getting some riffs together for the next big batch of songs. And uh, Justin, new bass player, and I've had a couple of just practice sessions together over Zoom or Skype just to, because uh, there's still a handful of songs that he's trying to learn from when he originally started. He had the whole back catalog to deal with. So, it, um, so that stuff will be there. Uh, as far as us playing together, our drummer, our drummer has a couple of immunocompromised people that he, that he lives with, so he's got to be really careful. So it may be a little bit before we can do full band practices, but it's definitely something we'd like to do sooner than later. Fair enough. And I have to commend your drummer too, for, you know, take, making sure he takes the time to understand what's going on living with immunocompromised people as well and ensuring their safety as well, because if you're living with them, you want to ensure their safety at the same time. You don't want to just go out and, you know, basically treat it like nothing's going on and and then all of a sudden you may get one or two people sick and then i love the fact that he's taking the responsibility and taking the initiative to make sure that those people stay safe yeah 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 the, the, doug uh doug 
Doug's, Doug's no dummy, and we we totally understand the the perspective. I and mean, I have a couple of kids in my house that you know kids aren't as susceptible, but you don't want to see your kids get sick with something like this. So we'll be a little cautious. No, because even like my mom and dad, they don't want to see me getting sick with them. Like I'm I'm 25. If I get sick with it, I and especially with how like my immune system is, I'm pretty sure I'd be okay. But still, it's there's points where it's just like, oh, you're you're going there. Um, yeah, there's like I'm going to a friend's house. There's like two of us there. Oh, uh, okay. I'm just like, uh, okay, we'll see what we'll see how that goes. And then, and, and then my mom gets a little freaked out sometimes when she goes to the grocery store. She's like, "There's so many people here. I don't know what to do." Yeah, it's 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 a, it's an adjustment, but uh, it's you know staying healthy and keeping other people from getting sick is important. All right, and because we were talking about the origins of the band, I want to go to PJ on this one specifically. What was the story behind you joining Head Honcho? How did that all come into play? Well, I moved here um, to Seattle nine years ago from a place called Rockford, Illinois. Uh, it's like northern Illinois near the Wisconsin border. Uh, came out here just for a change, and uh, I was offered a job to working on boats and things like that. So it was just a new experience. But after a year of living here, I was just kind of getting the itch to – play again you know i've been in bands uh pretty consistently since i was uh 16 years old so uh i just uh was kind of asking around some people that i knew played music and uh you know the style of music that i was into and uh one of the guys um eric magnus uh from a band called bigfoot accelerator just a local band up here uh he had kind of been asking as well. And, uh, he, uh, just kind of was connected with another guy and then just, uh, yeah, it was just kind of through word of mouth that I got into this band, um, that they're kind of looking for somebody and it just worked out, uh, that I was able to join. And I mean, once I heard their stuff and things like that, it was, uh, I haven't been in a band that is this kind of like heavy and technical before, but it was, you know, I was up to the challenge. And uh, I mean, that's really kind of like the style of music that I listen to the most, but it's not the style that I'm traditionally known for playing. So once I heard them, though, I mean, it was kind of, uh, you know, like that Southern California style punk rock you know and like and now that we've been over to europe and uh, realizing you know how technical it is i mean you can hear in the guitar playing especially ananda's end where it's just like got that kind of european style uh technicality to it so it was neat it, you know it's a it's an ever-evolving thing uh and the guys are really good at a um writing kind of different styles of songs i mean some of the stuff that we have i think is a lot more like metal thrash type of stuff and then then we can also go and do you know like these melodic almost pop punk style songs uh so it it's you know i've always been very lucky to be involved with talented musicians so that's yeah it's just that i've been able to do that and sometimes i wonder why uh i've been so lucky to do that so but yeah so one thing we'll definitely get into in a little bit is talking about uh some of the songs you guys have out there just kind of because i was listening to like put down a bunch of thoughts on them and just how you're saying you, know, you can kind of go through different styles like you know sometimes you can be a little bit more metal with a little bit more of a thrash influence in there you can go a little bit more pop punk style because i've got a couple ideas in there especially after listening to some of your music but going back into just figuring out exactly what really drives you and influence and what kind of music you listen to because with being with your band being really punk rock i was like i was happy about that due to the fact that i love punk rock and of course I've got like 13 or 14 different Rise Against shirts in my closet right now, and I'm wearing a beer T-shirt. Way, way to go me on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I want to go with that is, is what what's the type of music that you guys listen to in on an individual basis, and then how does that influence the music that you write? Yeah. Um, I, so, I mean, I, a lot of the music that I listen to are actually – kind of smaller bands that I've discovered over the last handful of years. Um, but, you know, some of which 
people have probably heard of some, some maybe they haven't, I don't know. But, uh, so is like bands that are kind of heavy rotation for me lately, the past couple of years, um, Adrenalize from Spain. Um, they, it's, it's like hyper melodic and technical skate punk. It's, it's, it's ridiculously good. And I've, I've had the fortune to see them live a couple of times and I, it, they are note for note perfect when they're live. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, another band that's a, a big influence on me because they really fit in the sort of technical with a mix of melodic and medical or me- metal space is uh, Anchors from Australia. Um, yeah, some really good friends of ours from the UK are in a band called Darko and I've, uh, that's kind of melodic hardcore, and uh, they're they're huge. For they were some of the first folks that I met when I the first time that I went over to Europe. They were the first ones that I met actually the first time I went to a show in Europe, and uh, meeting them actually was a big part of the reason why I ended up meeting all these other people and and learned about punk rock holiday and then Conrad Fest and all these different festivals. Um, so, so you know those guys those guys are really big influences for me. I mean Wilhelm Scream of course is an easy one. Um, Iron Maiden was actually an easy influence. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's, if that's answering your question, but like that, that's a lot of stuff that um, I listen to. And like, those are, those are good examples, I think of the types of music that, that influenced me. That being said, like there's always little bits and songs here or there. Like there's, there's this, uh, it's a pretty simple lead, but there's this lead in Throne of Lies that actually was kind of inspired by flamenco guitar and uh, just the, the scale that I used and kind of the way I, I lean into the initial lead. So, I mean, there's there's lots of other examples, but really the stuff that I think stands out, I think those are good examples of bands that uh, kind of kind of feed that for me. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's kind of what I wanted to get at, especially towards the end of that, where you're talking about how, like, do you have different things you listen to and then, like, all of a sudden little bits and pieces of certain styles or certain songs that you really are passionate about just might end up, like, having a little bit of an influence on something that you put in there. Like, oh, this might sound, that might take an influence from something like, um, I'm going to throw out random bands. Like, I'm doing an intro, might sound like something like, you know, Breaking Benjamin, because I'm a big Breaking Benjamin fan. So, like, it might work like that, but then the rest so- song sounds completely different, or a certain type of way they construct songs. It's just, I always like to see how that works because then you're bringing in so many different styles and so many different influences into your bass sound as well. And it just, that's what really gives it the unique sound that you end up getting because you're taking what you like. And putting it all together, you're not taking like, oh, I want to be just like, you know, bands like, oh, I want to be just like Metallica. Well, you're not going to be Metallica if you're going to try and copy them. You got to do your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other guitar player, Matt, his uh, his interests and his kind of uh, musical background and things that he listened to growing up. His, Van Halen's like one of his favorite bands of all time and uh, lots of 80s metal is stuff that, he, that he's into. And I am as well, but like I don't think it comes through as much in my writing as it does with his. And we share the, the writing load, you know, pretty pretty evenly as far as uh, riffs and song structures. And so I think uh, the, both of those different kind of areas of influence come through. I mean, Matt, of course, has lots of influence in the same bands I like and listen to, but I think his kind of uh, kind of like heavy rock and 80s metal sort of influence in his guitar playing really comes through and helps add a, a texture to what we do that, that I wouldn't be able to come up with on my own. Got to respect that 80s metal. That's what I grew up listening to because that's all my dad would ever play. So it was it was a heavy rotation of like Van Halen, ZZ Top, Poison, uh, Rush. Rush was always big. So it's like if, if I were ever to write music, I'm pretty sure like there'd be some points all of a sudden like some like, you know, that 80s rock or that hair metal would slip in there. But of course, my musical writing prowess is about as good as, well, something very bland like like spam. It, well, I mean, like I for me, I think and nobody's really raised it, uh, you know, musician friends and things who have listened to the new album. But the intro to the last song on the new album, the songs that we approach Ty. To me, it it is just a a classic sort of 80s ballad interlude, you know, with like clean guitars and a sweet, sweet lead happening above it. It's uh, it started actually as a bit of a joke. And then like more we messed with it, it was like, ah, this is all right. Let's keep messing with this. 
that's how you get some of these greatest songs though. You just end up rolling with something that you think works. It's incredible oh, yeah. how that can happen. Yeah, absolutely. Those ideas that you, you weren't planning on are usually the ones that make things the best. So oh, yeah, for, easily. for me, that I think that's a, I think that's a pretty solid description on the guitar side of things, like where that, where the influences come from. Um, yeah, I don't, P, PJ, PJ have to tell you about his, his singing style. I mean, I have, I have my opinions for sure, but his uh, singing style, I think comes from a lot of different places. Well, that's a natural progression. You know what PJ is about to say or whatever about to ask him because it's pretty much the same thing. What kind of music did you really listen to growing up and what kind of music do you listen to now and how does that influence the music of Head Honcho? Uh, well, growing up, I mean, uh, I listen, you know, to kind of what my parents listen to and it, like, you know, a lot of Beach Boys and, uh, you know, just like a lot of what would be considered now like the golden oldies and stuff like that. I really liked that. I was always in... Uh, like choir or, uh, you know, things like that when I was in, um, grade school and then into high school, I just liked singing. Uh, but then the way that I kind of just realized that I could, uh, like sing scream with, uh, people with, you know, I tried it a couple times and, uh, just at shows and stuff and, people would kind of give me compliments like, Oh, I can actually kind of tell what you're saying. Uh, you know, when you're singing or when you're like kind of doing that rough style vocals and stuff. So people seem to like that more. Um, and then also, as you mentioned before, you know, rise against, uh, Tim, the singer and I, like we played in other bands cause he's from, uh, a suburb of Chicago. Uh, he used to play in a band called Baxter uh, with actually Neil from the Lawrence Arms was in that band too. He was on guitar. Uh, but Tim was the singer and he's always had that kind of um, gravelly voice, but able to like hit different notes and things like that. I just thought that was neat. So uh, that listening to like hot water music, I liked how uh, Chuck and Chris could both, uh, be very aggressive with their vocals, but also have this melody that came with it too. So I've always been more attracted to that. Strung Out is a big influence on me. I just love the way that Jason Cruz uh, sings and the the way that he kind of does things with his voice. And then also I'm into a lot of like, I don't know, the nicest way to say it, but like kind of bubblegum punk, pop punk, where like, you know, kind of Motion City soundtrack stuff. And yeah, like I've Motion always City. heard those guys. I was like uh, the lyrics the that Justin wrote. Um, I thought, you know, he just uh, had a way of uh, saying things that I always thought was interesting and that affected uh, that. It kind of seemed like when he was writing it it was uh i could relate to the lyrics and things like that and i like the way that you know he did his stuff too so yeah and uh i mean a lot of just classic chicago bands 88 fingers louis uh is a big band that i was into uh, slapstick was a ska core band from there and those guys all went on to do different things brendan kelly the singer, uh, I always liked his like snotty punk rock voice, and he's actually the singer for Lawrence Arms now. Um, Dan Andriano, when he was singing, uh, also like backups with Slapstick, and then uh, went to make another band called Tuesday, and then now he's the bass player for uh, Alkaline Trio and uh, The Damned Things. Um, I always just liked the way that he sang and, you know, could have you know like some aggression behind his voice even though he's singing a song that's very uh heartfelt and uh emotional so and one thing i do have to kind of agree with you on is like the chicago music scene there's so many great bands that come out of chicago as well so it's like anytime i get to have a chance to go down there and see a show i mean it's it's, it's for me it's an hour and a half away so it's like yeah this is uh, this is gonna be awesome i feel like last year i was at riot fest and it was just Oh my God. It was like, I saw a couple of local bands there before I kind of camped out to, for Rise Against. And I'm just like, all right, let's just see what's going on here. And I'm just like, 
God I damn, that's good stuff. I was at Rise Fest last summer too. No way. Yeah, man. And that Rise Against set was to me was just absolutely amazing. That was that was an amazing set. That was had to be one of my favorite times I've seen Rise Against Live because I think that was like my ninth time seeing them. Maybe yeah, that was my ninth time, and it was just ridiculous because the energy was insane. The crowd was just, everyone was just kind of pushing forward. And for the first half of the set, like, I just was, I had no idea where I was going. Because all of a sudden, I'm like three rows behind the stage. And all of a sudden, I'm like all the way over to the left side. I have no clue how I got there. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, it's getting hot here. I didn't need to find some room to breathe. Someone opened up a mosh pit about 30 feet away from me. And I was so happy because I'm like, I'm going there because I'm going to be able to breathe in there. And also hit some people. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, Rise Against is one of those bands. Uh, an old band that I was in years ago. Uh, I think we played, I mean, we pl- played a couple times with rise against, but it was, you know, a place that's no bigger than, uh, you know, like a regular coffee step that you'd walk into it fit, maybe like 50 people or something like that. And their intensity has not changed. I saw them last year with AFI and anti flag at a, you know, 7,000 capacity club. They sold the place out. And, uh, you know, I mean, going from where we were playing to 50 people and then they were playing to 7,000 people, they, the intensity has not changed for that band. They always just hit it so hard. Like Tim is a great front man. Joe is like just this, he's like, just like a true punk rock bass player like you know he's got the melodies and the walkthroughs and uh, you know like that he can do and uh i think their guitarist name now is zach also yeah, zach. yeah and he's he's been i mean they've had like this revolving door of uh guitar players but uh yeah i think they found a keeper with him and then uh is brandon the drummer yeah brandon's been the drummer since like 2001 2002 so he's yeah. been there for almost 20 years now yeah, he was he was in the band when I saw them. He had moved from Colorado. He was in a band called The Clowns. And uh yeah, they it, you know, it's just yeah. So I guess Rise Against is a big uh, influence on me now that we've <laughs> been talking about them for the majority of the, <laughs> the last 5 minutes. Oh, don't worry. We dive in your music cuz there's definitely some points in there where I heard stuff. I'm just like and it got me real hyped. I'm like Oh, this has me feeling like Rise Against. This is great. So I was just like I I love talking about that stuff too and it's just I know one thing for me is like, especially with this podcast, like if I had to rank like like a guest, like a guest wish list for like, okay, who do I want on this podcast? Tim has the number one spot. If I ever get a chance to interview Tim on this, I'm I'm just going to be the happiest person ever. It'll be kind of hard to like sit still during it. I'm probably going to be like sitting there just like, ah, yeah. ah. <laughs> hey, we'll can I ask a question back at you? Oh, easily. Uh, so just for kind of satisfying my own curiosity, and this is something that I'm always interested in, in, uh, but what do you hear? Like what, what bands do you hear as far as influences when you listen to, uh, to our music? Well, I, I, one of the first ones that I really got was if, cause I'll jump into one of the songs and it was, uh, buildings and how they got there. Because initially I'm right when I listened to it, going into the intro on it in the first verse, you had this like. Just the way it was constructed it was classic hardcore punk sound. The drums, you know, they're consistently just smashing the snare and the crash cymbal. Guitar's playing that classic hardcore punk riff. And what it reminded me of, like, older, it reminded me of older Rise Against. So, like, something that came off of the Unraveling or something that came off of uh, Revolutions Per Minute. So, definitely more of, like, a... Because right now with their sound, it's more of like a refined punk sound. It's a little bit smoother, but it still has that anger and intensity in there. But if you go back to like 2001, 2002 with them, it was a little bit more brash and rough. But yeah, it's yeah. Still, But it was still yeah. w- really well constructed. And that's where I suck on there. I'm like, it reminds me of that mix with like a skate punk kind of style that you would hear on like uh, songs to be featured in older Tony Hawk Pro Skater games. So it was like a uh, older Rise Against mix with like Dead Kennedys kind of feel. <laughs> nice, but... I think that's the first time I've heard uh, Dead Kennedys, but I think I get it. Well, because I because I remember this is back when I was like, God, I was at seventh or eighth grade or something that I was in. I had to do a project on um, something. It was like some different country. I had to do a project on like researching it. And it was that I, I ended up drawing Cambodia and I had to make a video project for it. So, of course, I was playing guitar here at the time and Holiday in Cambodia by Dead Kennedys was one of the songs. 
So I got so I got an album from him and I just kept listening to it through and through because I'm like, okay, I want to hear that song, but I wanted to listen to everything else on there. And then I heard Police Truck and I'm like, I've been hearing this song since I was like four or five years old playing the original Tony Hawk game. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean the 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 songwriting of Dead Kennedys was incredibly creative and, and unique and it still stands out that way. So I, I take that as a as a pretty high compliment. Yeah, their sound was just uh, was just a little bit too early for their time, just the way they were playing it. Just it, as if they would have come out maybe about maybe ten years later, they might have had a lot more success. But they would have they would have been seen as the pioneers that they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like because they've been taking a look at like the notes I had for building how they got there, especially with that older Rise Against mixed with like you know like older Tony Hawk Pro Skater songs like Dead Kennedys, Police Trucks, something like that. I'm like, I love this because being the punk rock fan, it's that hard crashing sound that would be perfect to build a mosh pit for that makes you just want to jump into it so damn bad. That's awesome. Uh, Can can I press you for a couple more, just a couple more examples? Again, this is just my own curiosity being satisfied. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Definitely. Um, I'm going to jump into uh, But So It Is because there was another one there and it was there was an it was another interesting sound too because because I listened to it the way it was open it was similar with like a harder more classic punk rock sound with the instrumentation however there was just a slight difference and it was in the drumming because the drums hit with like a little bit, not as much vigor as they did on something like buildings and how they got there they still hit the crash cymbals hard and they mash that snare but it's not as rapid as like that classic hardcore punk sound so it was a little bit less guitars were higher tuned and then just listening to the the way it was paced and how it sounded, it was like that hardcore punk style mixed with ska punk. So I was getting a lot of like more like 90s ska band feel in there because when I was when I was in high school, my brother got into college. All of a sudden he comes back and I'm like, OK, what the heck is he listening to now? And he was listening to like Catch 22, Real Big Fish, Less Than Jake, Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. So like a lot of times I'm driving somewhere with them. Him and I, we have completely different tastes in music. But if we're ever in a car together, there's two types of music that we can listen to. Ska music and Irish music, which is re- a really weird combination. But you put on some Gaelic Storm or Flogging Molly, we're going to have a good time. But like we're listening to a bunch of ska music and I'm just like, holy shit, this is insane. So there was definitely like for But So It Is, it was like a punk mixed with like some third wave ska in there. And I was just like, my God, this is great. <laughs> And thanks. Yeah, this is it's it's always fun to hear like you know different views and perspectives, and a lot of the time, like like I feel like I understand that that as well, but I, I wouldn't have thought of it on my own. Like I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to identify that as part of what went into it. But now that you mentioned it, I I totally see it. And that, I think that all comes from when you're writing the music and you're uh, working with it and trying to create the song. And then after playing it for a while, because you've gone through that whole entire process and you know what was influencing you at the time of writing that song and what you wanted it to sound like, you're going to end up picking up on all of those that someone like myself might not pick up on. But then when I hear the final product, I might be picking up on something like, like I said, like on these that you might just not be picking up on. But then after you hear it, it's just like, Oh, I can totally see how that works. And it's just like, wow, I can't believe that we actually did that, but it's awesome. Okay. Now, well, thanks for indulging me. I, that, that's, uh, it's fun for me to kind of hear people's thoughts on that. Yeah. Cause it's, I mean, that's, that's the way it has to be. Just always have fun with it too. Cause it's always interesting to see what people think of your music. Cause I've had other bands ask me the same thing too. And it's like, I'm just like, Alrighty, get ready for this then, because <laughs> all of a sudden there there, there was one band. It was from Italy. I was talking to, and, they, and I was talking about their sound. They're like, "What do you think of our sound?" I described them as if "Bring Me the Horizon" didn't go soft after Sepaternal. Like that's how I described their sound. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, "Oh my god, that's what we were going for." <laughs> it's like hell yeah, I got it right. <laughs> that's what we have had at the end of shows. I've had people come up and uh, talk to me and say. You know, like the vocals sound like uh, they're like they sound like a Midwestern band with, uh, but the music sounds like kind of like West Coast. And it's like, oh, that's exactly what we are. Is you know, <laughs> I'm the Midwestern guy, and then yeah, we got a bunch of guys from the West Coast here. So yeah, it's yeah. nice when uh, people can just like, it's like, well, you hit the nail on the head. Good job. So. Yeah, because when you brought up the fact that you were originally from Rockford too, after listening to it, because hearing a bunch of different bands from different places, like especially around Chicago as well, like I mean, right, like Rise Against, of course, specifically for me, but 
other bands that necessarily aren't in the punk scene like Chevelle because they're, they're a big Chicago band as well. A couple other ones. Um, I stumbled upon seeing uh, they're a pop punk band out there called Belmont. They're not as big as I think they should be. Like they've got a really good sound and they've like I, I I was in Chicago for like just to see them as an opener for somebody. I can't remember who it was, but so many people were just like into this band. But I asked around like afterwards, like to see if anyone else knew about them outside of the city of Chicago. I was like, no one knew them. I'm like, huh, huh. These guys have a really good sound. OK, we'll just we'll just stick with that. But it's just like there's this you can always kind of tell a little bit with like different regions of like vocalists. It's, and I think it all again, all becomes on the uh different like regional accents because it's like someone that on the west coast is going to sing a lot differently than someone on the east coast so you're going to have a little bit of a different sound to it versus the midwest versus like texas and then florida because i always I always put those two states completely separate from each other because they're just completely different from the rest yeah yeah well and it's nice because i've heard you say uh chicago and it's nice to hear somebody say chicago the correct way because everybody out here says it weird so it's like when they say Wisconsin or uh, even when if you say the word mom out here, people think it's weird. It's like, really? yeah. So, yeah, it's nice to hear people speaking uh, the correct American English. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's we, what I do. You best. And I, Kevin, you and I don't have an accent. Everybody else has an accent. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I've, I've, when I was over in, uh, yeah, because I was over in Europe, it was people were like asking me where I was from. And because they couldn't put, they couldn't figure it out. Because I tell them I was American. It's just like, if one person like you don't sound like you're from New York. I was like, that's because I'm not from New York. Yeah, <laughs> and then it's and then I, I got someone else uh, like uh, different when, with when we were in Europe. It was a lot of uh, are you Canadian? Because also <laughs> I was, you know, I'm I I like to think I'm a pretty nice, easygoing guy, and uh, that's they. A lot of people were like, well, you're not American because like they just have a uh, maybe this preconceived notion of Americans like uh, you know being a little bit more pushy and loud and things like that. But Midwestern is, uh, we've got a lot of heart to it. So when I was over there, definitely everyone knew I was American, but it, it had to be from two reasons. It wasn't because it was pushy or it was just because like I would start talking to people and it was just the easiest thing ever. Like, I'm just like, Oh, Hey, how's it going? And just start a conversation willy nilly, no problem. But also the fact that I was always wearing a brewer's hat backwards always made it super simple for them to know that I was American trying to describe where I was from though. Cause I would just say Milwaukee. They're just like, what? Okay. Do you guys know where Chicago is? Couples, a couple, only a few knew. And I'm like, okay, I live, you know, an hour and a half North of there. But then I'm trying to figure out how the hell am I going to tell these people where I'm from? One of the cab drivers I had, I was trying to describe it to him. And all of a sudden he couldn't, after about five minutes started talking about basketball. And all of a sudden they're talking about Giannis Antetokounmpo. And they're like, we love him. I'm like, I now have him describe this. I'm from where that guy plays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was, it was super, it was super easy being over there. Cause it was just like, I, I knew kind of that they had a little bit of a preconceived notion of what it's like American tourists would be. But then I show up there as like this, you know, just, just happy to be there. Just big goofball kind of style. Just, eh, you know, how's it going? All of a sudden just walking around every single like, like little bar cafe I walk into. It's like, okay, I'll have a beer here kind of thing start talking to the bartenders and they're just like, Oh, we didn't expect this. I'm just like, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I had to remember too, cause I was, when I was over there for the first part of it, I was with somebody that was originally from the Ukraine and she's like, no, 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 you whatever you do, don't tip here. Like they actually get paid well. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to remember that. Cause I'm so used to it from, from, from that now that, but like my brother, he works at a bar in Madison, Wisconsin at the university of Wisconsin's campus. So trying to get service like anywhere down there is a like good service can be a pain, but he was like, okay, this is what you got to do on your first time you go up there. If you're going to be there for a while, just tip them real well in cash. And that's it. Then when you go come back the second time, if they see you, they they're going to come right to you. And, you know, because you tipped them well the first time and you made it super simple on them. Just if that's how you can do it, just do it that way. And I mean, I've done that plenty of times. I'm like, man, now I know how to work it. No, I know how to like at a at a big bar that's like packed. I know how to get service real quick. If it's yeah. a small bar and there's no one there and it's just the bartender, now I can have some fun. I can just start shooting the shit with them, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, I'm talking to some guy from or I'm talking to a bartender in Croatia, and I don't even remember what we were talking about. But I was my friends were wondering where I was for ten minutes, but because the bartender and I were just talking about the dumbest thing ever. I have no idea what it was, but it was just like 
okay, this is kind of fun. <laughs> That's, yeah. It's a it's a it's a pretty friendly and welcoming environment. I mean, in my my experience in Europe, like generally, I think that's true. But I think it's particularly true with the the punk scene in, in Europe. They're they're really really welcoming, and uh, that's you know it, it's I've got lifelong friends. You know, just simply from meeting people at festivals, and like you hit it off so well that you can't help but but stay in contact. So it it's it's a it's a pretty awesome experience over there. Where have, you guys all, where have you guys all played over in Europe? Have you just played like as many countries as you possibly could? Or is there always like when you go over there, there's like a set kind of like tour that you have going on that you're going to like stop at? So we've only <clears throat> we've only toured Europe once. Um, this was supposed to be our second time this summer. Of course, the pandemic stuff kind of canceled that. But freaking pandemic. Come on. They're killing all, they're killing me. Because I want to see so many bands live. I had so many bands and so many concerts. As all every band I've talked to, they had so many like shows lined up too. I'm just like, and we all get are just getting screwed because um, can't figure this shit out. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it is it is definitely unfortunate, but it's uh, you know it's, it's kind of the way the ball bounces, I guess. But we um so our, our tour a couple of years ago, the effect heuristic really helped us out and booked most of that and another incredibly good band from the uk called fair dues added us to a few shows as well and um so i'm I'm trying to remember so we started in in italy um with our friend pier paolo uh from gaster records uh he he set us up for a like a small multi-night festival that was going on it was that it's actually this really old uh it used to be a mill but now it's a restaurant and it's in a small town at the outskirts of the small town, uh, you know, in the, the lakes region uh, of Italy. And uh, so like that, you know, that was the first one. And it honestly was an amazing way to, to set the tone. Like the, the turnout wasn't massive. You know, there wasn't like a ridiculous amount of people, people, but there were at least as many people as there were band members, which was kind of nice. And um, the, the place like, you know, fed us and gave us, gave us wine and beer. And it was just, it was unreal. But anyway, so we started in Italy. Um, and then after that, I think PJ, what was next? Was it, it was, uh, Slovenia, Slovenia. right? Yeah. Yeah. Ljubljana, Slovenia. And that was, uh, and that was, that was pretty great too. It was, you know, the, the summer, the, the spot of time that we were touring isn't, really a good time to tour because it's mostly festivals and things going on and all the bookers and people we contacted you know gave us that warning you know head, heads up but you know we lucked out the the Ljubljana show as well like somehow just a ton of Americans who we didn't know happened to be looking for something to do that evening and they ended up at, at the club and there was actually a really good turnout and uh it you know that was an amazing and unique experience too because we were playing in a building that was a former Yugoslav military barracks, and uh, it, but it got, at some point the city turned it over to an arts commission and now they have shows and artist lofts and things in this space. Um, yeah. See what was uh, after that was Zagreb. the next night was uh, Zagreb, Croatia, and that's the the capital city of Croatia. And we it just the stars aligned and we were actually there when Croatia was playing in the world cup finals oh, against no France. Way. So it was basically that the entire country of Croatia descended upon Zagreb and was there. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, even though they didn't win the game in there, uh, yeah, they didn't win the match, but they were still just, everybody was so excited just that they were part of, everything and it was i mean part of history for them too and yeah the the it was a great show and it was just great to see like uh we were at a place in time that will never be able to be recreated because of you know everybody was there the the energy there was just i mean you could just feel it it was like this buzz throughout the whole city and it was yeah that was an amazing show uh after that, we played uh, Novi Marov, Croatia, uh, and that was a smaller place. Uh, kind of, the EU um, had uh, let them let this collective of uh, people put together. It was an old schoolhouse, I believe. Uh, they put that together and gave them 
some money to put together uh, a venue. And uh, so, you know, the EU government uh, uh, gave them some money to, because the European Union uh, is a big believer in the arts and things like that. And I mean, anybody that goes over to Europe, wherever you look, is just everywhere is a piece of art. So uh, after that, we did have a night off in Vienna, Austria. And uh, that was nice, it, you know, just being in Vienna. I mean, just talk about uh, living uh, in the middle of, an, uh, of a painting, basically, or, you know, of a sculpture. I mean, just the whole city is just amazing. Uh, after that, we did, uh, I think it was three or four shows in different spots in Germany and then ended it with this festival in the uh, forests outside of Nuremberg, Germany. And uh, yeah, that was, that, that was a great show. I mean, that's, uh, but so it is. The first song on the new record is actually written about the final night that we had on the tour. Uh, and just like, you know, how, uh, you know, how it affected me. So, all right. Now I want to dive deep into that because I'm curious as to how you wrote a song about this your last night over on this European tour and put it as your first song on the your new album. Oh, well, I met some uh, somebody and we became really good friends and just had like it was just a great night and like at the end of the entire festival it was it's set out I believe I said in the woods so everybody's camping and things like that. There's nothing really around there within you know i think it's maybe like five to ten miles uh to get to let's say like a convenience store there was a hotel that was maybe half a mile away but uh you know we were lucky enough to stay right on the um campgrounds and things like that but at the end of the festival uh you know everybody was just in such a good mood and everything happened uh and then the djs uh or the sound guys just started kind of playing a mix of a dance music and not, not a club dance music, but just, you know, like they played some David Hasselhoff, which is a, (laughs) he's a huge uh, German star music star over there. Uh, I mean, they played Frank Turner. uh, uh, They did a live in La Vida Loca, Ricky Martin. I mean, it was just a, a bunch of songs, everybody, and just all of a sudden, everybody just started dancing that was still around and stuff like that, and started raining just enough to uh, keep everybody cool, but not to soak everybody and ruin the night. And it was just, yeah, it was a, a great experience of, uh, you know, living in the moment and stuff like that, and just realizing, like, we got to do this and like, you know, this is like, you know, one of those chapters in the book of my life that, uh, you know, people might want to reread because of how many amazing things happened over all of it. And, you know, I mean, we, we owe it really all to Ananda because of like, you know, the way that he is and, uh, he's always just so excited and sociable about things that he's passionate about and the stuff that he brought, uh, the excitement that he brings to other people when he's, uh, able to, um, you know, talk to like-minded people and like, just have somebody listen to what he is interested in, you know, the, that made it. So we were able to go on tour with another band. We were able to get on festivals and like do these amazing things. And it's all because of, uh, you know, the passion that he has towards, uh, what he does and what he's into. And, you know, like he's, uh, he is one of the biggest cheerleaders like, uh, that I've ever met. So, yeah. That's you, some, yeah. you, have to, you have to give him some pom-poms who just be like, go team. Woo! <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, gonna, so th- that song was just, yeah, written about uh, basically the whole tour, but like, you know, just all of it culminating in the in the final night of uh, the festival and tour. 
So that's a, I mean, that's a great way to, thing to write a song about too. And like taking a look at your Spotify right now, outside of buildings and how they got there, which is your most popular song on the platform right now. But so it is, is second on that list. So you can, oh, one thing I can always tell from different bands is especially when you're, when the writing style, when you're really writing about something that really is much more personal to you, whether it's something that's a little bit more, you know, like a heavier topic or a more loaded topic or something like that, where you're just looking back and just the culmination of something great that happened and just expressing those feelings through a song, especially on, uh, yeah, especially on, uh, but so it is where it kind of has that, uh, like Scott punk feel to it as well. And the construction with it. And you're always, and that always brings up more of like a more uplifting kind of sound too, just cause it's a little bit faster paced, a little bit lighter as well. So you really do a uh, feel a little bit more of that kind of the jubilation that it on the excitement that it all came from. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got to use jubilation on a podcast. Oh yeah. yeah <laughs> now I am happy about that. And I'm, now I kind of want to jump. I want to jump into the album "Appetite for Distraction" as well. And the first question I have on this whole entire album is the album cover. Why did you guys decide to parody the "Appetite for Destruction" cover in the way you did? Because when I first saw that, I was like, "Wait a minute, this isn't a different band. This is Guns and Oh my God, they totally parodied the hell out of it." <laughs> yeah, um, I had all like, um, I always liked that. I mean. I think personally the appetite for destruction, the guns and roses record, I think that's one of the best front to back albums that rock and roll albums that's ever been made. But, uh, I always liked that cover and I had always had the, uh, for years I'd had the idea. I wanted to do just a shirt for us of our skulls and stuff like that. Um, in an upside down cross, just cause I like the, I like the uh, visuals of that and stuff like that. So um, that and uh, yeah, so I had just come up with the idea, a friend of mine from back in Rockford, who actually is a tattoo artist in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, Amanda P. She uh, was gracious enough to make the artwork for us and uh, do everything like that. And then, we had been kind of back and forth talking about uh, record titles, and uh, I just kind of brought up to the drummer how easily distracted I am and stuff like that. And uh, I was, you know, talking about one thing and then ended up talking about three different things. And then we were talking about the record, and uh, he just said, uh, Appetite for Distraction. And uh, it just kind of all made sense. So it was. Uh, yeah, everything just came together at the right time. So, yeah, the record cover is just uh, an idea that I had had a while ago, and I just thought it was a neat thing to go with. So, I had to bring it up because it was like when I got that email, it was the f- one of the first things I noticed was because the album cover was included in that email. I just looked at that and I just, I, I just, I thought that was a mistake, honestly. At first, I'm like, why? They definitely sent me the Appetite for Destruction cover. I'm like, why'd they do? Oh, and then I started looking at the skulls, and all of a sudden, I thought, oh, this is definitely something different. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would, uh, you know, in in the back of my mind, I, I really hope that we hear from uh, Guns N' Roses' uh, legal team, at least, and say, like, <laughs> cease and desist or something. I mean, just something so we can, you know, the most dangerous band in Seattle, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, there are bands that I've seen that have done something like that, and I've got a perfect example of it where it's they've done something, and I thought they're and you, everyone thinks their lawyers, like the lawyers from the company, would come or the band would come after them, but nothing ever happened. That's uh, that's Ice Nine Kills when they got uh, they were pl- supposed to play in the ho- at uh, House of Blues Orlando with Fall yeah. in Reverse, but all of a sudden they got banned from playing there because of the violent imagery, because it's all, you know, horror movie and horror based with, with all their music. So they've come yeah, out with yeah. these shirts of different Disney characters as horror movie characters. It was like Mickey was Freddy Krueger. I've got a poster right above my desk right now. It's got a huge Mickey face. Eva's evil Freddy Krueger. Then they had Donald Duck as Georgie from Stephen King's It about to be eaten by Pennywise. You had Goofy oh, as right. Leatherface. I'm like, oh, this is hilarious. And all of a sudden, they never got a cease and desist letter from Disney, and they did it. Ag- they did it again this year because I got um, one. It was it has Michael Myers trick or treating in Mickey years, and then there's another one I found. It was uh, Donald Duck walking to the Stanley Hotel as Jack Torrance from The Shining with an axe. Huh. I was just like, wow. 
oh, this is hilarious. And now a bunch of them are just hanging in my closet right now because I saw those shirts. I'm like, oh, this is too funny. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, you, you never know. All of a sudden, you never you never know. All of a sudden, you know, tomorrow you might get a letter that says cease and desist per, you know, Guns and Roses. And you might just sit there and be like, well, we'll have to, dang, we have to change the cover. But we got some <laughs> attention now. Let's go. <laughs> and then you yeah. can use that dangerous band in Seattle moniker. However, the fact yeah. that you just use it, you might be able just to use it right away. <laughs> well, I, I mean, Axl Rose, I know he is... Uh, very busy fighting uh, with the current administration on Twitter. I don't know if anybody else has been following that, but <laughs> Ax- when, when, when Axel Rose is having better ideas than our federal government, uh, I think we're, <laughs> we're, we're in an interesting time to say the least. So say so this is the same guy that at one point during his career just jumped off stage to go fight someone in the crowd. Yeah, sometimes you gotta, you know, <laughs> clean house. So <laughs> sometimes you gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to jump in the crowd and beat someone up. That's exactly. just the way it works. See? <laughs> so And now with with that different distraction, you guys released it on May first, twenty twenty. So uh, was that the initial planned release date? Did you guys think about pushing it back at all due to COVID nineteen or were you some were you in the mindset of this is coming out on May first? And as many people are going to listen to it due to the fact that everyone's still locked down, sitting inside, and they're always looking for new stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that, that's, that's kind of more, more along the line, line of thinking. We actually kind of pulled it in, pulled the data in. It's like we still don't have the physical copies. We're still some weeks away from having the physical copies. Um, but, yeah, it was – I mean, it's been done for a while, so – we had some personal kind of motivation and interest to, to get it out there just because sitting on something that's done that you're proud of is really hard to do for a long period of time. And, and you nailed it, Kevin, with uh, your description of like people are home, so they're going to listen. And we're hoping for that. And we have, we've had a really good response to it. So I think, think it was the right decision. Wish we were a little further ahead on getting the physical copies delivered, but you know, whatever, nobody's playing any shows right now anyway. So, yeah, but yeah. The, most, the most important fa- factor of it was you got your music out. So the fact that when people were sitting at home doing nothing and trying to find new things to do or new things to watch or to just listen to, especially in music, you guys were able to provide that as well. Because a lot of the bands that I listened to, a lot of bands that really went in deep with some of their albums, that especially released in that window right after COVID hit in the middle of March between April and May. A lot of those bands that put out music there, like those records shine and they shine even brighter just because the fact of the matter was people were begging for new stuff to listen to. Like I really got into the new August Burns Red record because it came out right the right at the beginning of April. And it's and all of a sudden yeah. you go layer down the line uh, right at the end of April. Trivium released their new record and it was the perfect time for them to release because no one was really releasing during that time as well. All of a sudden they come out with an album. It was absolutely fantastic. I've seen a lot of other bands go the exact opposite route, like what you guys were saying about um, not having the physical copies done yet. A lot of bands were waiting or push their records back because now with everything going on with the pandemic, they were waiting so that they could potentially release it back when everything got opened up again, they could start playing shows. But then again, you missed out. As I always thought of it was you missed out on the perfect time when everyone has nothing to do and you're giving them something to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, the, the release, we, we were supposed to be releasing the record. Our, our release show on May 16th was the original one. And we were going to be playing uh, with some friends of ours from Portland uh, called uh, GFL and also two real great Seattle bands, one called Mangy and the other one, Mabel's Marbles. And uh, we were supposed to do that, have the record, the physical copies in hand. But yeah, as everything just kind of slowed down, then, uh, you know, we just kind of had a band meeting and uh, just took it upon ourselves to put it out. Um, and then we've been wanting to do uh, um, uh, a video for every song on the record also. So right now we have four of them out um, and uh, four videos out. And uh, yeah, just kind of keeping content and just things for people to watch. I mean, you know, everybody's seen Tiger King. Everybody's, you know done all that stuff so you know just something else to pay attention to and something to keep us busy as well yeah it makes sense because yeah tiger king everyone's seen that already the the last dance documentary about michael jordan everyone basically saw that and then 
now with certain states having to like are reversing and doing sh- uh, shutting stuff down again, it's you're going to be getting people that are going to be like, OK, take a look at Netflix. We've already done this stuff. Or it's like especially in southern states right now, it's like it's good. You know, it's summer out. But in places like Arizona and Texas, I mean, because because during my for my full time job, I work with a bunch of pe- couple of people that work out in Arizona and they're like saying, oh, yeah, it's supposed to be 117 today. Who's going outside in 117 degrees? A lot of people. It's like yeah. it's like it's like a Midwest winter where you just don't want to go outside because but the exact opposite, because it's too cold or you don't want to, you know, go and slip on some ice or wake up. And all of a sudden you walk outside, it's negative 20. You're just like, oh, why am I leaving today? But it's just yeah. like kind yeah. of the idea behind it where you're so it's you kind of can focus in on, OK, finding new ways to get your music out to people during this time taking advantage of the fact that everyone is still on their phones on their computers smart tvs whatever the hell they're on right now and how to reach them and if you're going to come out with a new video for each and every song because out of if you have four done out of seven i mean you only got you got three more to go but still that's three more opportunities to get you know in the minds of different fans especially punk rock fans across the like across not only the, the united states but across the world as well because you've got all those ties over there yeah, well, and uh, I mean, that I believe Ananda said earlier, because we were supposed to be pretty much, you know, I think a week from now, we were supposed to be leaving for our Europe tour, and we were going to do uh, a couple festivals and club shows and things like that once again. <clears throat> but um, now that we have, you know, basically, we just heard from everybody, and they say, hey, just plan on a year from from when we were supposed to be doing it. So. Luckily, if once everything opens up and, you know, I know Ananda has been working on stuff and, you know, just we've been kind of slowly writing. It'd be nice. Maybe we'll have an EP's worth of uh, new stuff to uh, record and bring over and, you know, just have something. So we'll be playing our new record for the first time live with a, a European audience as well as, you know, hopefully some new new stuff as well. New stuff added. Yeah, definitely. I mean, everything you're saying definitely is something that really has been making me think you're definitely taking advantage of the time that you have right now in this ever since the the pandemic started with trying to not only grow the band as large as you possibly could, but making sure that you're also set up so that when you are able to go on tour again, that you're set up for that as well. Yeah, yeah. Making the most out of a bad situation. That's how it's done here. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, because so, I'm a I'm a huge purveyor and huge uh, attender of concerts. I think last year I went to something like 27 or 28 of them, and went to a good amount of couple of punk rock shows. I think I saw how many times did I see Rise Against last year? I think twice. Yeah, twice. Uh, always in a mosh pit for somebody. Like, because I went to go see Anti Flag and Pennywise. They played here in Milwaukee, and it was just one of the funnest mosh pits I've ever been in because it's just the energy provided is insane. And just listening to your music, I get the same feel as well, where it's going to have that high energy punk rock music. Where for someone like myself who loves to jump into a mosh pit, I'm going to have one hell of a time. So, when it comes to you guys playing shows, what are your shows normally like, and what could someone attending them expect? Uh, they can expect, uh, probably, I mean, we try to stay as tight as possible. I mean, we, we are always on a regular practice schedule, um, and things like that. Uh, and personally, I hear that, uh, you know, like I'm way more energetic than people I think are expecting me to be. So, uh, you know, I'm a real big fan of cardio. So like, I like (laughs) running around, jumping around. I mess with Ananda a lot. Uh, you know, like Ananda's not, uh, Ananda has always claimed that he's not ticklish. So, uh, <laughs> I do my best yes, to, uh, you know, to, to make, uh, you know, to make him, uh, laugh and things like that. The drummer, I always kind of, uh, just, I try to interact with everybody. Uh, the, the other guitar player, Matt <laughs> is not a big fan of, uh, interacting with me while we play but uh you know he's not uh, as long as i stay just about a half inch away from his arms reach he he can't get me stuff like you gotta be quick with matt but uh the new bass player um we we got to play one show with him and then the next week actually was when the uh quarantine started so uh 
I didn't, it was his first show and I didn't really want to physically mess with him too much. Uh, I'm not violent or anything with anybody, but you know, I do like to, uh, kind of get into it and, you know, do my thing. So belly uh, rubs, noogies, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. My, my new favorite thing to do is, uh, whenever anybody's singing background vocals to, uh, like uh, uh i don't know what that's called when you do that mumble i don't I, I don't i don't know but the fact of the matter is whoever's watching the video they're gonna see you just going me, 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 me. Right. if you can make that into a gif i'd be more than happy so. you might be able to do something like that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but it's no pete PJ PJ has a, a lot of energy and really really does put it all out every show, which is awesome because I'm like I, I can barely play my parts, so I'm it's uh like I, I'm I'm not I don't have the best stage presence. I'm usually sort of like uh, looking like I've got a, a deer in headlights look. Like oh how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Um, and uh, so P, PJ really does a good job of interacting with the crowd and in, being entertaining and. It's far, I mean, by a factor of 10. And I've, you know, I've had some pretty engaging front, front people that have, I've been in bands with, but easily by a factor of 10, PJ is the most energetic and engaging front man that I've, I've ever played with. So it's, that's pretty great for us, especially for me, because it covers for my lack of mobility and excitement <laughs> while I'm playing. And not only, well, not only that, but if you take a look at a lot of bands as well, you take a look at any band or any concert you go to, usually the band that's on stage, not only their music, but how they're performing on stage always ends up dictating what's going on and how everything is going to sound as well and how the crowd's going to react. Because I've been to shows where it's just like, okay, the band goes up there, everyone stands up there, they just play like 12 or 13 songs and then go off. And I just stand there I'm like, that, that wasn't that much fun. Because... There's no energy bouncing back and forth. Otherwise, I'll, yeah. uh, sometimes I'll see bands where it's like they're um, th- very big theatrical, like a very big stage presence kind of thing where it's just they're really trying to put on a full performance. And for me, that doesn't necessarily go over as well because it's just like, OK, you're and you're, you're watching the show, but it's like the music is to kind of get a little bit lost because of how big this show is. I always love watching bands when either they have like a certain like theme or something or if it's just a band that just goes up there plays and just enjoys the hell out of themselves and just drives that positive energy for because i've like seen bands like i mean rise against is a perfect example of it with just how much energy they bring at every single show and how the crowd ends up feeding off of that energy other bands that i've seen do that uh bear tooth is by far one of the best ones that does it because if you ever see bear tooth live caleb shomo is just the most energetic person on stage i think i've ever seen yeah. <laughs> And it was insane watching them play. And then I prevail went on when I saw them after Beartooth and everyone was kind of bored because it's like, we just saw what they did. And then I prevailed. They're not bad, but it's just, they just couldn't follow up that energy. And of course the, the end was, a, or the band that headlined that show was a date or a member. So it was like, oh, if they would have flipped yeah. Beartooth and I prevail around just for the sake of the show, not for the sake of who was bigger or not, it would have been a much better show just because all of a sudden Beartooth leading not a date or a member. Oh man, that energy was just going to be going back and forth like crazy, but it's just, how that energy works and then just watching the band on stage and just seeing how much fun they're having and how much energy they're bringing the crowd can feed off of that and then it can be just like a feeding frenzy back and forth it's all of a sudden you could go from a show where it's like okay this could be good this could be bad it's all of a sudden you have a show where you're going absolutely nuts and the crowd is just going even crazier making you want to even go harder and then it's just kind of sleep going back and forth to see who can top each other the band on stage or the crowd just keep going back and yeah. forth. But it's never in a way of like, oh, we're going to show them. It's like, okay, you're going to show, you're going to show some energy. We got this for you. And just kind of sleep, you know, doing something like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's also, you know, like whether we're, you know, wherever we are in the, um, the, in the time slots of bands and things like that, it's always, you know, I always just think that we should go as hard as we can because, you know, we play as we all, we're going to play as well as we do, uh, you know, whether we practiced or not, it's going to be a reflection of that. Like the songs are, are what they are, but I mean, just playing is kind of, you know, I want to go hard and then make the next band want to go harder, you know, and that's, or if we're the final band, like I like getting pumped up by the bands before just because, you know, it's like, we're there. We've worked for months to play to, five people 
And, but I'm, you know, it's five people or 500 people. It's just, they're there to see you because they appreciate what you're doing. So it's the least we can do is just try to put on a good show. So it's, yeah, like we need, you know, the energy of five people can feel like 500 as long as you're, you know, you're going to get back what you put out. So I guess what I'm trying to say. Oh, easily. I've seen, I've seen him in parts of rooms of like only like maybe a thousand people that felt like it was like a full on festival, like felt like it was at, like at riot fest, like with, yeah. I don't know how many people like, I, I'll, like I'll use example, like, um, shoot, what band was it? Yeah. It was the first time I saw ice nine kills. It was just the energy that was in this basement room here in Milwaukee at this place called the rave. Cause they've got three different oh, yeah. levels. They got a huge ballroom. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about PJ, the huge ballroom upstairs. Then they have like their standard, like, you know, like, club with a little bit of a balcony in the middle then they have this basement downstairs it's just it's just a basement in the stage and yeah. just the energy that was in there because maybe a thousand people there maybe i don't know but it felt like what it felt like for like if i would have been in the middle of the pit at riot fest for when uh when slayer performed but yeah, of, course, so I was, of course good. of course i wasn't so I was, good at riot fest. yeah i was gonna say i wasn't that close for slayer because i i i was like i could go i could try and get close for slayer or i could you know, basically put all my eggs in one basket and stay put for rise again. So that when they end, I have to go all the way around to try and get them. Like, you know what? I came here because I want to see rise against again and I'm going to stick to it. And I was happy about that. But even with that Slayer show, like, cause I was far away for it. I you could feel the heat from the pyro just all the way, like maybe like a football field's like the back. Yeah. It was, it was intense. But one thing, um, because I know uh, PJ said he had to get going around like uh, about like ten minutes from now, I think. So, I'm gonna yeah. ask you guys if you guys got time for one more potential question before we can uh, send you on your merry way. You guys can uh, do whatever you're doing the rest of the day, or keep making kick-ass punk music, whatever the whatever the two. I mean, hopefully it's both. <laughs> but because just kind of talking about concerts, and I always like hear it if someone has like a really insane, wacky concert story, like their your best like concert story that from something that from a show that you played or a show you went to that you were a part of, whatever it might be. Is do you have any story that just like sticks out to you when you guys were playing live? Like something crazy happened, just something that you tell everybody or whatever it might be. Well, for me, it it's uh, more that uh, I need to calm down. I guess is a. Uh, we were playing in a, there's a town called Tacoma, Washington. That's about an hour south of Seattle. We were playing there, and I love Tacoma. It's a working man's town, and I'm part of the labor force. And you know, like I just, you know, I I could feel like you know, like a kinship with the people that are in that town and that go to the shows and stuff like that. Uh, but I used to. Um, I always bring my own microphone because from years of touring, I learned that using other people's microphones, you kind of get that. It's like this weird smell of everybody else's breath on there. <laughs> and also it's just from being on tour. It's a good way to keep yourself healthy. If you have your own microphone uh, instead of using the house microphone. So I have that and I have like a 30 foot mic cord. So I just usually attach that to the, to the, mic cord that's on stage so uh that's provided by the house and uh i would ball it up and i you know throw it and things like that well one time we were playing at this venue called the valley and there's a ceiling fan above and i threw the mic cord in and it just caught the ceiling fan and just started wrapping itself up and it was in the middle of a song and you know i didn't like i wasn't about to pull it down i didn't want to I didn't really want to buy a ceiling fan that, that night. So, uh, you know, I kept singing and it just kept going up and up and up and just away from me. So that's something that I remember kind of a little bit of egg on my face from just me being uh, too overzealous of like getting into things, but yeah. So that's, I guess that's my story. So say if anyone tries to give you anything kind of crap or you can just say i was trying to lasso the ceiling fan and i clearly hit it so yeah shows well, what you I guys just, know i was in, i was engaging with our biggest fan <laughs> oh, oh that is good that <laughs> is you. good you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right so. now did you have any story like that that just sticks out in your mind i don't really have anything good like that i mean i'm I'm sure there's something, but nothing's really coming to mind. I mean, I have un unexciting stories. Like one of my 
one of my favorite shows of all time, uh, and this is going to date me pretty badly here, but uh, Agnostic Front, when they were on the Liberty and Justice 4 tour, this was like, I think it was like 88, 89. It was, it was a long time ago. And uh, I, I mean, I, you know, so I was a teenager back then. And uh, that, that particular tour, that particular show, Roger Murray just had his daughter. So like we're, we're in the DC, this is the old uh, 930 club in DC. So I grew up on the East coast. I moved out here when I was about 21. And um, the old 930 club was a small, a small space, way smaller than the current one. And so it's just totally packed. And the DC punk scene at the time, like, was really diverse. They're, you know, skinheads and punks and metalheads, but everybody went to shows together and stuff. And so in the midst of the set, and it's just, it's this amazing ripping set. They've been absolutely slaying it. And uh, he's like, everyone quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. He's like, no, like, completely quiet. And the crowd's, like, completely silent. And he brings out his baby girl. And she's like, she's awake, just kind of, you know, barely looking around. And, and uh, I don't know, for me, that really, it, it struck it struck a nerve because it's one of the best shows I've ever seen performance and energy wise. And then coupled with it, it, you know, that's when I think I first started to realize that this feeling I had of community with my friends in the punk scene, like that wasn't unique to me. That was something that existed, you know, wherever, wherever people wanted to, to provide it or find it. And, so that that show sticks in my mind. It's 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 not a, it's not like a great story for the question that you asked, but it's an important. It was an important moment in my music musical uh, development, I guess. Well, well, I mean, kind of taking a look at it as well as we all have those. We both all have those stories where it's like we take a look at like concerts that really affected us, or concerts where it's just like something crazy happened. Because I have stories like that as well with like different shows that I've been to where. Like there was like one Rise Against show was like I went to it and it literally made my life. It was like a huge like turning point for my life because it was going one direction. I went to that show and then it was like I can pinpoint that show as the light day my life took a complete different turn that I was never expecting. Yep. And then, of course, a bunch of stuff happened there after like in like up through there. And all of a sudden I was like things weren't going so well. And how do I start turning everything around? By going to see two Rise Against shows in like the span of two months. That's how you start turning everything around. And you know, but it's, like- you mentioning that actually reminds me there is one that probably would have been a better example. So in a 2014, I was in Amsterdam for work. It was like a work related trip I had to do. And uh, at the time I was like, just looking up all these little European bands that I knew I'd probably never had a chance to see in the U S in Darko earlier, they were playing in a, a wrecking house in Germany, which is this small, not super small, but a small city in kind of Northwest Germany. Um, so I was able to get my boss to let me, you know, take Friday off. I got all my stuff done for my work trip. And I went there by myself to that show. And Matt, the other guitar player uh, in our band, had messaged Darko and said, hey, uh, my bandmate and buddy, he's coming, uh, he's gonna, he's coming from the U.S. He's going to be at the show. And, uh, you know, he told him to look for a guy probably in an RKL shirt. He was right. And, um, you know, they kind of saw me coming across the parking lot and called me over and introduced themselves, you know, gave me a beer, got me a shirt. It was great. It was a really cool show. But then at the end of the night, right before their last song, they were thanking all their friends who had come out. And uh, Dan, the singer, was like, you know, but we'd really like to take a minute to thank not this guy from the U.S. I don't think he even knew my name at that point, but and uh, for coming to the show. And I got mobbed by the crowd, like in the middle of the crowd, everybody came and hugged me. <laughs> Up and they didn't let the song start until everyone was done and that was a that was a pretty amazing experience as well i mean it's kind of along the same lines as those feelings and what i learned at that agnostic front show but it was another life-changing experience you know for music oh easily and it's just w- one thing kind of want to end out this i just want to see if you guys kind of feel the same way it's like when you're playing live shows or when you guys are playing live shows or like for myself when i'm at live shows it's like anything else in the world just goes goes away. Any problems, anything that's going on just goes away. All that matters is what's going on, enjoying the show. For me, of course, getting the mosh pit, potentially hurting myself, which has happened on a number of occasions. Almost breaking my nose, cuts, a couple cuts above the eye, a couple black eyes. You know, the normal stuff. Nothing, nothing too major. But yeah. it's just the, the, the it's like there's a certain euphoric feeling of happiness that I get when I'm at shows. And kind of hearing your guys' stories, it kind of feels like the same way, not only going to shows like you were talking about, Nada, but also like what PJ was talking about with playing shows and, you know, 
trying to get in contact with your biggest fan that was about maybe like what <laughs> twenty feet above the stage. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, on that note, guys, I mean, we've done pretty, we've done about almost an hour and a half. And I know PJ, you said you had to go somewhere around like 1230 your time, which is 230 my time. Taking a look, I got like five minutes left. So want to make sure you get to uh, do whatever you need to do. But yeah. on that note, do you guys have any final remarks before we send you on your merry way? I'm just uh, check out. Uh, we're on Spotify. We're on all the, all the uh, platforms. Um, check out the videos that we got out. Uh, you can just search Head Honcho. Uh, you can also go to uh, Head Honcho Music dot Bandcamp dot com. Uh, and there's we have our all our records up there for sale. It's a pay what you want. Um, so just you know get the music, enjoy the music. If you tell one friend about us. That'd be a great help. So, yeah, I it, uh, just you know hoping hoping that uh, everybody's kind of keeping sane and safe during the the lockdown, and hope uh, hoping that we can continue to do a little bit, like getting these videos out, maybe a couple little surprise things here or there, just to kind of keep musical ideas flowing. But uh, yeah, if if people are interested in checking it out, like. We really don't, you know, nobody who does this does it cares about the money. Like it's the money is such a tiny aspect of what's there. You spend way more than you, you ever take in for most bands. So uh, please, by all means, go download, download them. And, and that's the most important thing is that people get the music and check it out. And for everyone that's listening to this, just take a look at the description. If you're watching a YouTube video or if you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or Google Play, take a look at the description. You'll find a spot that says Find Head Honcho Online. You'll see all their social media pages, their YouTube page, their Bandcamp page, Spotify. Anytime you can get connected with this band, just take a look at the description of the video or the podcast. You'll find it there because, well... Just making it a lot easier on everybody. I mean, it's a lot easier just to click the link instead of having to type something in. So we're going to make it as easy as possible for them. Thanks, man. Yeah. And then on that note, um, I want to thank you, PJ. I want to thank you, Anata, for coming on. Head Honcho out of Seattle, Washington. And once, you know, once, you know, you guys can start playing live shows again, you go over to Europe and then. Well, if, if you guys are over here at the same time I'm over there, I'm definitely going to try and catch a show. But if not, um, on my travels at some point during, well, hopefully, hopefully end of this year, but probably be next year. Or if you guys end up coming around, you know, PJ's hometown neck of the woods like Rockford or go to Chicago or something and I find out about it and you see some guy potentially break his nose in a mosh pit, there's a 95% chance that's going to be me. Great. Yeah. <laughs> now, and the plan is, uh, since Europe got canceled, the plan was to... Uh, you know, we hopefully we've always wanted to go do a Midwest thing because I just have friends all over there. So, uh, you know, it'd be nice to do like just a long weekend, something like that. Maybe do Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago or Rockford area, something like that. But we'll keep everybody uh, abreast of that information. Sounds good. And especially if you make it Milwaukee, you guys can make it super easy for me to come to a show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Madison as well. Cause I'll stop at my brother's bar and drink first before I come over to the show. So I'll be, I'll be a little, there. I'll, I'll, I'll be a little tipsy by the time I get there, but you know what? It'll be all worth it. Cause I've done that for other shows as well. They've been just absolute fantastic shows to be at. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's on that. So PJ and I thank you very much for being on the podcast. Everyone go check out head honcho at site for distraction on all uh, stream platforms where you can find it. And the links are going to be in the description for this podcast. So you guys can check it out and make it as easy as possible to find their music because yeah, go listen to some good punk rock. Why don't you? <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Thanks Kevin. Appreciate All right, it. Thanks guys. And instead of saying goodbye, I'm going to say this till next time. Sounds great, man. Thanks a lot. Whoa, 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 folks. That was my interview with PJ Ananata from the band Head Honcho, Hardcore Punk, out of Seattle, Washington. And I love hearing all the stories they told. Love talking music with these guys. And you guys know me. I love punk rock. I can't believe I didn't wear a Rise Against shirt when talking to a punk rock band. I mean, come on, guys. What is wrong with me? Wear my Wisconsin Line and Google shirt, you know? Of course, I do something like that. But, you know... At least PJ was from Illinois, so we got the whole entire, you know, reference to the whole entire thing. Well, the fact that it actually just kind of worked out naturally. I mean, 
I had no idea. <laughs> but in the end, it was fun talking with those guys. I'm really hoping for a chance to see them live, especially if they make a little bit of a Midwest run if they stop anywhere in Chicago, Rockford, Madison. Hopefully here in Milwaukee make it easier on me. But you know what? I'm going to take it as it comes. And if you get a chance to see this band when, you know, everyone's back to playing live shows after the whole entire coronavirus pandemic has come to a stop because it needs to. Yeah, go check out these guys because especially hearing how crazy PJ is on stage and hearing about and kind of experiencing how when front men can go crazy on stage, just kind of how that drives the energy. I definitely want to be at one of those shows. So I want to thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Core Progression Podcast, where we are unearthing the underground and bringing bands that are growing and emerging in the scene, giving it more, you know, giving more prominence to them, shedding some more light on them so that you guys can get in the know with them now before everyone else does. You can brag to your friends. Hey, hey, hey. I knew before they got big. And come on, who doesn't want breaking rights over their friends? Come on, let's go. That's me for me. Thank you guys for listening to the Core Progression Podcast brought to you by my song of the day, Rock 2000 Day. My name is Kevin, and you guys know how I end every single one of these episodes with a big, healthy, and hearty see ya!